Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Paul Doyle, and this this is a module that we've developed, um, as Deirdre said, over the last couple of years. So what I want to just go through is a little bit about the motivation, why we did this, and uh, where it came from, uh, what's it about, what's the aim of the particular module, um, how we organize the whole thing, and really how we run it. So some of the, a, a little bit of the detail, but I won't necessarily go into all of it. And how we assess the students, and to some extent, where do we see this thing uh, going forward in the future. But for me, uh, the motivation is actually the interesting part behind this. So I've got 20 years industry experience and about nine years, I think, academic experience. And I, I think that's really kind of helped us form an idea. Because the real problem uh, sometimes when you look at students is that real world can actually be very different to the environment that we provide in college. Right? So there's lots of uh, opportunities to go and work in industry and, and you have an internship. But even that isn't necessarily enough. So that depending on the internship you do, um, you don't necessarily get to work with people in other teams. In fact, internship, to some extent, can be a very protected environment. Right? And the motivation for this um, became because I worked in a multinational. I worked in Sun Microsystems. I had this weird experience where when I was in Dublin, um, I thought the Dublin team were great. Right? I'd meet for coffee, we'd have a chat with people, we'd, go, we'd discuss the project, and we absolutely were on top of everything. And then I got a job in San Francisco and I went over to Silicon Valley and I thought that team was great but they thought the Dublin guys were no good, right? So we had this perspective of we're in different locations, we have this view of our own world and it's hugely based on communication and contact with people on a regular basis. Um, but the multinational environment that we work in, this kind of global work, is really about trying to figure out how do you get on with people who you don't know? How do you get on with people who you don't see on a regular basis? Are the methods of communication good enough? And how do you give a student this kind of experience? Now, we're really lucky because three years ago, uh, myself and, and Michael, uh, with some help from Kieran, put together an international degree where we said we want our students who only want to work in Dublin to figure out how to have a motivation to go across to the likes of Korea or Germany or Ulu with all of our partners. And then we said, well, when they're there, do we want them just to kind of live in that environment and experience Korea or experience Germany? He said, no. If you're going to have you know, the motivation to go and, and, and go to these places, we want to mix it up a little bit more. So we thought about the global classroom. So we wanted students to come out of college with an experience that was, they'd been under pressure before, right? They'd seen how difficult uh, this can be. And I have a few stories to tell as we go along about just um, how, how mixed up that actually can end up. So we really want students with a greater balance. We're constantly being told there's technology students need to, to have, um, there's things they need to learn. But when I was in college, the most important thing uh, the head of school ever told me was, Paul, you've got to keep learning. You've got to figure out how to be a better person in terms of the industry you go into on a regular basis, which means you've got to figure out how to learn and you have to get on with people. So what is the global classroom, having tried to build it up? Um, it's very simple, right? It's an IT project where all of the students are in a different place. So if we decide that we want to build some software, it's easy if I talk to the guy beside me and we have a chat every day and we try and build something, but what if you weren't in the same room? How do you manage this? What are the stresses associated with that? And can you actually succeed? And if I put a time limit on this and say, I'm still looking for a high quality IT project, can you deliver with people you don't know, people you've never met, people you will probably never meet, and actually deliver something? So we, we took a few ideas of projects we were already running internally, so we have these team-based projects, and we said, um, let, let's try and get these people together, let's try and do it online. So um, with a couple of lectures, we, we came up with a model. So the idea, um, for example, would be that we would have um, uh, teams that are created, right? not teams that are allowed to form. Because I've never worked in a company where the managers come up to me and said, who would you like to work with today? Right? That doesn't happen. You work in a team. The guy they hired is the guy beside you, is the guy you have to work with. So we don't allow that to happen. We don't allow you to pair with your mate. Right? So we have Irish people working in Korea, uh, down in Daegu. We have Irish people working in um, Seoul. We have Korean people working in Germany. We have Finnish people working in Dublin. And we basically say, that's your team. 
for good or for evil, you have to figure out how this thing will actually function and how to work together. And more importantly, keep focusing on the IT stuff, right? Which is just our little bit of way of saying, hurry up and get something done, and all this other stuff, you're just going to find uh, how to work through it. So if the aim is to create a, a greater balanced computer science graduate, what we expect is that DIT graduates or graduates from any of our partners, when they go out, will have experienced something that their teammates in their new company won't have done. And it'll allow them to just take that extra breath and say, OK, I know this is stressful. I think I can do this. And I could probably do something that two years ago I didn't think I could do. And um, one of the examples is we have um, a cultural difference between our Finnish students and our, our Korean students and our Irish students. And it's very interesting to see because it's happened for three years in a row. The Finnish students stand up and they say, I'm going to lead the project, right? Koreans say, that's great, right? I'm going to work hard because I'm a really good IT person. And the Irish guy is looking and thinking, I can do anything. Maybe I could lead. Maybe I could do something else. I'm not sure. How are we going to define the roles? At the end of the project, it's what's different. We interview these students. We ask them, said, how is that for you? The Korean students look at it saying, I could have led that project. Right? Why wasn't I putting my hand up? Because these guys look more confident. So they're learning something out of that. And they actually take that into the next role and say, you know, I've seen what everyone else can do. The standard's OK, but I'm, I'm at that standard. Right? And then other people looking and saying, well, the IT is OK. Maybe, maybe I could actually go down and do a bit of development. I just thought everyone was better than me. Right? And by forcing teams where you don't know what the guy beside you does every day, you don't know what his standard is. And this is what um, you get in, in a lot of times in competition. When you're in a class, you think you're in competition with your class. You're not. You're in competition with everybody, right? But sometimes we don't have the opportunity to meet all of these, these people from, from different uh, places. Now, this is a module. There are academic learning outcomes, and we have them defined. We obviously have some rigor associated with this. And the kind of um, academic learning outcomes we, we might put um, in front of the students is where we tell them, you're going to learn how to work in a team. We're not going to tell you how to work in a team. We're just going to, we want you to experience this kind of stuff. Um, you're going to learn how to um, look at leadership as a concept. And, and does that work? Are you a leader? Are you not a leader? Are you a follower? How do you want to get on? So we've listed all of these things. But you can't account for actually what happens when people get together. So I said I'd tell one or two stories. One of the most interesting stories about this um, project was um, last year. So uh, the person running the course came to me and said, Paul, something's just happened, and one of the team members has completely blown up, right? Completely blown up. I said, blown up as in had a bad day? He said, no, social media, it's F this, F that. The whole thing is a complete mess. I said, what's wrong? He said, the pressure has got to him in the team. What will we do? Will we apply the rules of you know, the standards we have in the institute and have a chat and said, you're not allowed, as an academic, registered in our programs to do these things? He said, no. We've put them in a, a pressure situation. We want to talk to them. So we offered this guy a little bit of extra stuff. And um, we had this odd cultural clash, which you know, I wouldn't have known uh, coming in. And he said, I work very hard in this team. I work really hard in this team. I probably work harder than everyone else in this team. I said, OK, so why are you getting upset? He said, nobody else in this team works. I do all the work. And when I finish the job, they give me more work. I said, well, OK, it's not totally unexpected from my point of view. He said, no, so you don't understand, Paul. This is only one of my courses. I'll work really hard for two days. I'll get my whole work done for the week. I'll go to the leader of the team and say, I finished my work. I'm brilliant. And he says, great, I've got more stuff for you to do. And he said, but there's another guy over there. And he didn't finish his work last week. And he didn't get any more work this week because he didn't finish his work. This is not fair. Right? <coughs> and um, we had this exchange um, where he blew up and didn't know how to come back into the team. And the conversation, um, which I think came out of this, was really what this project kind of uh, epitomizes. He said, what are you going to do the next time this happens? How are you going to deal with it when you're in industry? And he said to me, because he started, we had a Skype conversation and, and started off with the, thanks for taking the call, Paul, just so we're clear, I'm not doing this module. No, I don't care what you say to me, I'm not coming back in. So I said, but what are you going to do the next time? And he said, probably the same thing. I said, OK, so we have to stop. We're not going to apply the rules. We want to talk to you. And um, 
at the end of it I said, um, you know, if you have a family, if you're working in industry, and one of your colleagues seems to be on your case the whole time, you can't walk out of the job, you can't leave the team. You have to figure out how to deal with this. So um, he figured out how to save face. He figured out how to go back into the team. I talked him through it. I said it won't be easy. And, um, and he got through it. I was really impressed that he could actually take a moment, take that breath, and actually get through it. And we want people not to fail the industry. We want to provide an environment as academics where we apply that pressure, but you can't fail, right? Because we'll give you the extra support. And for me, the global classroom uh, is very much about that. So in terms of how it's organized, we have a mentor um, for each team. So we, we decide that five or six people are in a team. They have a mentor. The team has to organize themselves, right? So we're not telling them, you have to meet on Tuesday, 5 o'clock. This is your classroom schedule. We say, no, once a week, you have to turn up. So when I worked in industry, every now and then, the uh, director would say, you have to turn up and tell me how you're doing. Fine, that makes sense. But the rest of the time, you have to figure out how to make progress. We let the team do that. So we give them uh, regular content. We give them one hour a week, regular contact. And then the, stu the students uh, self-organize, and they invite a mentor in. And the mentor is not the project leader. So sometimes you make this mistake. Uh, as academics, you go in and say, I'm going to tell you how to run your project. So no, we don't want to tell you how to run a project. In fact, we're going to reverse the role. I'm going to tell you what I want as a customer. So every time you're not quite sure what you want, I say, well, I'm the customer. So in my particular case, I was running a project. It was a 3D chess game. They decided to do um, some online nice AI kind of stuff with some graphics. I said, who's it for? And I said, actually, it's for my eight-year-old. It turns out he's really good at chess. And they said, so what does that mean? I said, well, that means you need to have an appropriate UI. Some of the stuff I've been seeing, you kind of need to tone it down. We don't you know, pieces killing each other. He's only eight. But you have to be able to beat him. And I was thinking, oh, it should be easy. I said, well, OK, have a game against him. He's pretty OK. And then they realized they had to step up their AI. But it just gave a slight slant on the project. So I think the mentors uh, play an important role by not trying to tell people how to do things, but tell them, I have a requirement, and you have to figure out how to meet that requirement. Um, so these student-defined meetings um, mean that the students have to meet on a regular basis, but they have to invite the mentor in, who may <coughs> or may not go. But he can go at any point. I was sitting on a train between Seoul and Daegu, and um, one of my colleagues, Paul Burke, said, I'll be back in a second. I said, what are you doing? He said, I think the students are having a meeting. I just want to dial in and see what's happening. Because that's the real world. It's not 9 to 5. It's not like 6 to 8. It's not on your time zone. It's just about um, getting involved when you need to and being flexible. And for the students to realize that sometimes we are watching, we are listening, and we want you to, to go through this whole process. So the teams have to fill a role. And I said, sometimes at the end of the project, people think they should have done a different role. So we allow them to change the roles. We've had a number of projects where teams have gone and said, well, I was the team leader, and I never want to be a team leader again. I think, and why? Because, well, no one, no one listened to me. I told them what to do, and they didn't do it. I mean, what kind of team is this? They said, what's the kind of team you're going to face in, in the future? You have to motivate them. You have to be part of the team. You can't tell people what to do. You have to help people do things and motivate them. Um, so a lot of learning back and forward. Other people went into safe roles like documentation. Um, and then they realized that they had a lot of work to do. Because everyone says, you need to document that. I'm thinking, really? Uh, you want me to document everything? I said, again, welcome to the real world. It's not just to write down a couple of things. Everyone wants it written down so we can present it as evidence of our work later. So the role stuff is nice. Um, yeah, so I've already talked about the mentor, so I'll leave that aside. In terms of the sequence of events we bring students through on this project is they'd have to form a team. Now, they don't get to choose the team, but they have to decide how to be a team, right? Which is not that easy. And um, they have to decide you know, when they're in conflict for who wants to be the leader. How do you resolve that? Because half the time they turn to lecture and said, who should be the leader? I'm thinking, I don't care. You have to figure this out. And if you don't like it, you have to figure out, do you want to rotate it? Does everyone take 5% leadership? Or is one person saying what's going on? Um, you have to bid for a project. There's no guarantees you're going to get the project you want. We give them a list of projects, and they have to think about it. And they say, I'm good enough to do this project, so if another team wants this project, my bid has to be better than their bid. Right? 
And if it is, they get the project, and if they don't, they're told, sorry, you didn't successfully bid for this project. We weren't convinced as a team that you wanted to do this. Then they do the usual things from a software point, point of view. They submit designs. A team charter came in because of this very issue with this blow up in social media, right? Where everyone kind of froze after two weeks and said, we don't know how to work. So the team charter gives them ways to behave inside the team. And we ask them now to do that up front in case this happens, right? So it's only happened once or twice. Um, they have uh, project plans, risk management, because the biggest thing, of course, is what if you can't get it done? What's going to happen? There's six people involved here. After 10 or 11 weeks, you have nothing. And you come to the final demonstration, nothing works. What are you going to do? Because it's 10 credits, two modules, you're abroad, you're going to have to repeat something. You can't do this module again, so you have to think about all the failure side of things and how to do risk management. Um, project plans, yeah, um, submit a project um, and the supporting documentation. So we asked them not to do documentation for us, but to do documentation that makes sense. And suddenly, if the guy isn't in the same room as you, you can't just tell him what you want. You have to write it down. You have to write down the requirements. You have to tell him how to test it. Because maybe you're not going to do all the testing, but you're going to write it down because someone else has to do it. And say, so how do you know he did the testing? Well, you better read my document because it says everything that needs to be done. And then gets handed off. And then you do a demonstration online, which in itself is really hard, right? Have you ever seen five or six students on Skype trying to talk to each other and present in any kind of coherent way? It just does not, not happen, right? So the first couple of times we kind of send them back and said, you probably need to think about who's talking first, who's going second, is someone managing the slides? And you think, okay, these are simple things. But not the first time, okay? The first time it's hard. Should they pre-prepare a video offline and then say, I want you to watch the video about our project and then I'm going to talk to you about it. I wish they'd do this, but it takes them about seven weeks before even thinking that this is a good idea. Right? Um, and then we do exit interviews. Exit interviews are fantastic, right? So an exit interview is where you as the assessor look at the guy and say, so, did you think John did a good job? and they look you uh, in the eye across this video screen thinking he either did or didn't, right? Because there's marks at stake. Because there's marks for the project. So you get a mark because you did a project, the project is either worth something or not worth something, right? So just say this project's worth 70%, it's a fantastic project. But it turns out John, not picking on you John, right? Didn't do that much as far as I'm concerned. So he might get less marks. But if he gets less marks, someone could get more marks because you say it has to average to this number. So if everyone gets 70, that's a really easy way to assess. We don't do this. We get the reflective journal, and we get the interviews together. In the interviews, I had one case where I, I asked everyone, I said, I don't think John did a thing in this interview, or in, in this project. Seriously, I was in all the meetings, and they said, nope, nope, John did a great job. I'm thinking, really? He said, you didn't see it, Paul. But genuinely, he did a great job. Behind the scenes, he's not really good in front of um, people watching him, but he helped me, he gave me a call you know, when I was struggling, he did a few extra things, um, he's not taking credit for anything, he did a good job. I think, fair enough. And sometimes that's what we miss as assessors, we, we just have this vision into it. So you allow everyone to know that it's mark at stake and, and to help each other grade themselves. The reflective journal is something we have in multiple things. We have it in our internship, we have it in this module. Because you can't be a better person, you can't learn from something unless you think about what happened. You, you genuinely can't. If you continue to stumble through life making the same mistakes, it means you never thought about it as a mistake. You never thought about it as something you could actually do a, a little bit differently. So we expect students to be able to think about what they've done and to talk about what they've done, and to teach them how to go back over everything that's happened and say, um, when you say things like, I'm behind schedule, stuff happened. Think of why are you behind schedule? What happened to make you behind schedule? How did you get here? Would you get here again with exactly the same circumstances? And if the answer is yes, then either there's something genuinely going to stop you being there, which is fine, or you just didn't organize and manage things, you know, consistently. So reflective journals 
in academia is a nice way for the student to start learning for themselves rather than us telling them what's wrong, because I don't know what you did for seven days a week. Right? Um, so this is just an, sorry, an idea of some of the projects. Um, I need to keep an eye on the time. So, um, so we, we ask students to, we, we give them very basic ideas and they have to come up with something interesting. I don't know if you know what Plex is, but it's an online media service, right? So a bit like Netflix. So before it used to be video stores where you go and say, well, write a video store uh, database system. Say, no, do something creative. Get a, an online media system where it'll go look up what the movie is based on partial text and think it's probably this movie. Show me the ratings. Show me the reviews. Show me some videos. Show me a trailer, right? And go do that. And again, oh, OK, so that's interesting. Or e-voting and then ask them to walk you, walk you through uh, the American election maybe or some other kind of e-voting system in Ireland which is where is the security, how do you hack it, are you sure it's secure, is it a good idea? And then 3D chess or AI physics games or whatever it might be. And of course uh, we bring them through planning, we bring them through design. Uh, I've got a, a background in testing so we want them to be sure that what they give us is actually tested. And that actually causes some of the biggest stress in, in the team. One guy said, well, I wrote it. I'm not testing it. And some guy says, well, oh, hang on. Um, but I don't know what to test. He said, well, it's in the requirements document. And the documentation guy said, oh, yeah, I better write that document. Right? So <laughs> suddenly there's a reason for things that um, only exist when, when projects become uh, real. Um, so we do a lot of this online. So we, ha we have this concept of um, online teaching. We pre-record stuff. We've asked our Korean partners to do a cultural video. We said, what's it like working with Koreans? So Lauren did this, um, this video for us because she's worked and lived in Korea for 20 years as a Scottish person in an interesting perspective. We've asked our um, Ulu partners to say, why do the Finns keep wanting to lead the projects? Please, can you do a video on, on, on Finnish behavior in, in projects? Um, and they go and do that. So every partner, and when we look at Hublinked, um, what, what we want to see is we now have more partners, we have more experience, we've got people doing lots of different things. We want every partner to bring something to the, to the table. Right? We want them to help us add one more module, which can be watched offline, and then help them through the project. So when they say, I don't know how to test it, oh, we have two, two videos on this stuff. If you're a software engineer, go and have a look at that. So where are we going in the future? What's this in terms of Hublinked? The future are more people, a more dynamic group. If you're running something very similar to this, you'll find that you're heavy on IT or you're heavy on business or you're heavy on marketing. We want to use the opportunity in Hublinked to look at this kind of uh, system and get more uh, expertise in. Right? Business focused. So we're asking them to be creative, but we actually it's, you could easily ask a business to say, have you got an idea for a prototype? We do it in Cedar as an actual internal company, but we could also do it in projects. We could make them longer. We could do prototyping. One of the great things of working with um, one of our partners in Finland, they, they did this tour, this fantastic tour of their facilities and said, we do 3D printing. And they do it brilliantly. So it's for medical stuff, you can see, can I think of a project? All I could think of was, can I think of a project that would require me to 3D print something, right? Because I'd have to figure out, you know, all of the bits. Because then I'm thinking, oh, that means only one guy has it, right? And how does that work in a project? And how do you demo that? And then there's another lab where they do um, printing circuits, right? On paper or skin or whatever it is. I'm thinking, wow, biometric kind of stuff. How could I think of a project for this? And every partner has something different. Every partner has an expertise. So the future of the global classroom is global labs in, in Hublinked is very much about trying to be creative as academics, as industry people, and get students genuinely to stop looking down thinking, tell me what to do, but looking up and saying, what could I do? And I think that's what this is about. Thanks for listening.